architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk. We are in our third season, thank you for continuing to listen. And today I have a fascinating conversation here with Renee Cheng, who has uh, just taken over as Dean of the College of Built Environment here at the University of Washington. And I discuss with her her interests in collaboration, conflict resolution, interdisciplinarity and the experience of growing up and working as a woman of color in this very uh, male-centric professional environment of architecture. Here we go. Well, Renee, let me welcome you to the College of the Built Environments. Thank uh, you. We are so excited to have you here as our new dean. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm still counting as new. This is my first academic year, so I still count that oh, as yeah, new. Oh, yeah, you're totally in the honeymoon <laughs> period, so you better milk it yeah, all I know, you can. I know, I plan to. <laughs> <laughs> and you've come in with, uh, uh, you know, a lot of focus and energy, uh, which I think is being appreciated very much. Uh, and you uh, seem to have some core driving uh, values or things that you're interested in. I'm reading mm -hmm. some things that you've written about on questions of collaboration, diverse, diversity, equity. Mm -hmm. You know, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, w w what are the some of these core values you're pushing here and why, mm -hmm. why are they so important for us here? Well, and I think they're interconnected. And so for many years, actually, my work on integrated project delivery, building information model, kind of new, innovative ways of working in the building industry was kind of one stream of my research. And then my work with women in architecture, equity, equitable practice was another stream of my work. Yeah. And it's only actually been in the last year and a half or two that I've really started to see how they're connected. Uh -huh. And that the teams that are high performing using some of these contractual models or digital models or whatever they're doing in order to be able to be successful in these very demanding projects were because they were showing a really high degree of collaboration and intercultural skills and working with each other. Right. And that if you look at issues of intercultural competence across gender or race lines, mm -hmm. the skills to do that are really very transferable or kind of the same skills right. as you would use to collaborate across disciplinary boundaries. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And so just depending on how you're defining diversity in what context, those skills of being able to adapt and be able to see the other person's point of view, really be able to welcome those opinions even right. if you don't agree yeah. in order to get at, well, what are they seeing that I'm not seeing is all related to issues that will, miscommunications that will happen between an architect and a contractor right. are similar, or you can look at the root causes as being similar to sometimes things that happen across gender lines or race lines right, right. around topics. We just, often those gender and race lines are with people that aren't necessarily on the same project team. Yeah, yeah. Whereas if you're on a project team, you know we have to work together in order to get this project done. Right. And so, you know, the equity things can feel a little more nebulous, like, oh, we should do this because we're good people and we want the world to be more harmonious and have less conflict in the world. But in fact, it's about everybody being able to get what they need done effectively, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that it isn't all about harmony and avoiding conflict. It's mm -hmm. actually about figuring out where we are in conflict and figuring out how to work together through that. Right, so. right. So in the end, you are arguing that uh, it's not just about uh, better civil society, it's actually also highly productive towards, uh, you know, let's say efficiency of pro projects and you know, the output, is that yeah, what you're saying? Yeah, and it sounds kind of like it's, um, it's too reductive sometimes to just think about, well, we only do this for efficiency. Right. But when I talk about these issues with the uh, non-academic audience. The professional audience. You mean like our professional audiences? Mostly our professional audiences, yeah. but also the lay public. People start to slot you into a box like, oh, 
it's somebody's going to tell me about yeah. how diversity is great and how if I'm especially if I'm white or a white man, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. going to get scolded now and I should that's be right. better that's and right. I should do more and I you know I just <laughs> don't have enough uh, people of color on my teams and yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. Yeah. and they just go into this mode where they're not really listening and they're kind of like mm -hmm. okay I should do that I know it's a good thing to do. I might even know that there's an ethical argument for me doing this. Yeah. And I've heard that business-wise, my clients are looking for it or something like that. But when I dial it back to everyone wants to be effective, and our building industry is particularly ineffective right, and unproductive. Right, right. And so when you come at it from that angle, a lot of people's energy changes around it. Right, and they right. kind of like, oh, I never thought about it. We have diversity. We've got diversity of yeah. disciplines. Right. And of course, it's not to say that you shouldn't also have diversity of the you know gender, ethnic, religious, yeah, yeah. all those other dimensions. Right. But it helps people understand, oh, I deal with diversity every day. Yeah. Even if I only see other white men right. predominantly, yeah. they are coming at it from these different things. And I am using these skills, and these right. skills are things that would be useful to me. Mm -hmm. And by the way, they will also help me feel more equipped to deal with the difficult issues around race and gender that might come up with people that I don't have to be on a project team with, right. or that I might have to be on a project team right. with, or that are my clients or whatever. I mean, it seems like a very good topic, particularly given the sort of, let's say, uh, divisive political climate of our times. Do you not think? I mean, yeah. uh, there is a larger topic uh, that is embedded in this. Do you feel like uh, you are politically driven also in the larger uh, uh, sort of situation? Uh, or well, not? I wouldn't be upset if this ended up creating <laughs> a major political change. But I think anytime you're talking about these things, you're talking about power. Yeah. And you're talking about who's being disadvantaged or mm -hmm. who's being systematically disadvantaged or systematically yes. not being included. Mm -hmm. And Particularly, we are we are we are seem to be institutionalizing discrimination nationally yeah. nowadays. I mean, and we have for a long time, we and have we're for maybe a long just time. seeing it more now. Right, and it's um, it has become politicized in ways that are sometimes productive and sometimes not productive. Different. So when it's productive, you say, okay, this is about social change, and people need to take a stand on what they believe in, and then be able to not just act themselves, but be able to influence those that might have a larger sphere of influence or be able to control more policies or budgets. Or It becomes political in an unproductive way when it's, I, you're either for or against me. Yeah, like yeah, either yeah. you're, you know, and because you're against me, I'm also then going to say you're part of the institutional racism and you are perpetuating this because you want to and you, you know, I might, I can, in, in my own world, call you a racist because you're not fighting right. the institutional racism because you don't see it, right. you don't think that you're part of it, yeah, yeah, yeah. you think it's too big for anything that you might do. Yeah, yeah. And then that's political in a really un totally unproductive way. Because mm. we all have our spheres of influence and we all have what we see and what we don't see. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to be woke all the time about everything to everyone. Right. And that's a lot to ask of somebody yeah, yeah. to move through the world and constantly be seeing mm. all of these systems of oppression and racism. I think there are easier ways to say you move through the world in a way that is cultural. Mm -hmm. You have been privileged if you are coming from certain backgrounds or cultures or you've been exposed to certain things that, and that privilege isn't something that you asked for necessarily mm -hmm. and it's not something that you should feel guilty about. It may come with some responsibilities because it comes with potentially some power and some influence. Sure, sure. But you, it is part of how you operate in the world. And so being aware of that doesn't mean that you have to constantly be correcting or... I mean, it seems to me one of the things that I have heard uh, is that we often tend to be, uh, in the academy, mm -hmm. tend to be accused of... Uh, certain elitism. Is that fair? Fair? I think it's fair, isn't it? Well, we it? come from a lot, so, you know, you and I are both people of color. Yeah. You know, I am a woman of color in, mm -hmm. in, the, in a college that has never had a person of color and never had a woman right. and in, uh, the, in, in the, the dean in role. In the dean position, right? Yeah, yeah. And so having the privilege of, you know, I also have you know, two degrees from Harvard yes. and I am FAIA and, yeah, yeah. you know, I have a lot of the markers of the um, 
dominant culture success. Right. You know, yes. And I have operated in according to those rules and succeeded according to those measures. And it's given me a lot of, so there's, you know, in the language that I use in the AIA guides, um, I am in most, most, many of my identities, I am an agent, not a target, right? The target part of my, so instead of saying majority, minority, mm -hmm. which is hard to, like, is that just like a numbers thing or a proportion thing? Mm -hmm. We talk about dominant and non-dominant culture. Right. And in America, the dominant culture is white male. It is the group okay. that is most advantaged. Systems are set up for them. Target and agent is a, a number of other layers, right? So you can be, so I'm not part of the dominant culture, yeah. but I'm an agent in many ways. So sure. I am, I'm a dean, I'm yeah. highly educated, right. I come from a socioeconomic class where education was really predominantly, you know, featured. Um, I'm a parent. There are lots so of So how do you negotiate that? I mean, you have different uh, power roles yeah. uh, constantly. Yeah. I mean, w w what is it? What is it you're saying? You, you deploy what is necessary? Well, so we're always, we're, we're all always adapting and contextualizing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the training that we've been going through just recently with our students this morning is around, you know, say like direct and indirect communication, which is a very cultural thing. Right. And so you have certain things that you, your cultural programming will make it easier for you to be. That doesn't mean like if your cultural programming is to be indirect, mm -hmm. you can be direct. It, you just have to realize that it's work for you yeah, and you're yeah. spending a little energy to do it and you're choosing to do it, mm -hmm. sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. Mm -hmm. And it's against your natural patterns, right? And right. so, you know, when you're a, um, so many times mm -hmm. you can look at who I am and what I do mm -hmm. and it's hard for me to say I don't have privilege, mm -hmm. right? Yet, I'm a woman of color, and there's a lot of things that aren't set up right. to make it easy for a woman of color to be where I am. Right, right. And so I have privilege, Yeah. but I've also had times where my identity has not been an advantage to Right, me, right, you know? of course not. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about that as a woman of color. Would you share uh, a little bit about your journey to this? Sure. To the, uh, I mean, what, 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 what jumps out to you as yeah. sort of significant landmarks? Speaking as who I am, right? Yeah. And so in many of my identities, yeah. um, you know, there were times where I didn't necessarily know architecture was something I wanted to do. Right, right. Um, and then once I was in architecture, I ended up essentially leaving the field. And something that not a lot of people know is that I left architecture completely for about two years you did? ceramics. You did ceramics yeah. for so two years? I did ceramics for two years. Okay. So I was, <laughs> when I graduated from school and yeah. I went right into a job at IM Pay and Partners, mm -hmm. which was, I am uh, changed to Pay Cop Fried when I right, was there, right, right. Um, working on really huge, huge projects. And it was, you know, a wonderful office in many ways, totally civilized and lots of my classmates were there. Um, but we were working on these huge projects and I just had this tiny little piece and I didn't understand the bigger picture and I didn't yeah. feel like I was really yeah. contributing. Yeah. So then I moved to a really tiny office yeah. where I was the only employee of this guy who was doing really nice work for these beautiful um, big shingle style houses on Long Island. Uh -huh. And one day I was placing a tennis court on this property for this big brand new construction and I went into architecture for social housing, right? And I'm placing oh. this tennis court for this guy, and I'm like, <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> so, so crisis I don't of understand <laughs> why I'm doing this yeah. and, and why I care, you know? And so I said, I really need time off to think about this architecture thing, right? Like I've worked in a big, yeah, famous yeah. firm. Yeah. I've worked in a tiny little firm doing exquisite work. Right. But I don't know why I'm in this anymore. Okay, what and brought so, you out then? So then I uh, luckily was in the situation where, again, the kind of privilege is that because of the way that my husband's work was set up, we were living rent-free in New York oh, okay. for a little while. Wow. And so for that year and a half or yeah. so. And so I actually had the luxury, and I also privileged because my parents really prioritized education and they had saved all their pennies. Mm -hmm. And I graduated with very little student debt because mm -hmm. my parents had paid a lot and they were saved. And so my student debt was very reasonable. But and I'll so, come back to that question. So okay, I, had, uh, I had more choices mm -hmm. than a lot of people would at that time. Right, right. And so living in New York, there are a lot of great places. And one of them was the Greenwich House Pottery, 
which was an old mm. settlement house in Greenwich Village. Yeah. And so I started, I had done ceramics when I was in, in college and loved it. And you know, my mom was a ceramicist and both, both my aunts are ceramicists. And so it was something that we had, I had always grown up with and done. Um, but I got really serious about it. So I was doing show and sales and I was, you know, in the whole community of full-time ceramicists. And, and then, so after doing all these show and sales and getting involved with some people that were doing these beautiful wood kilns and um, it just wasn't big enough. You know, and so big enough? the the scale, like literally the scale, right? So, so I was even doing down from the so I was doing really bowls yeah. and you know teacups and teapots, and then so there were people doing much larger things, which is a much bigger commitment because you have to have a much bigger kiln, much more space in the kiln. Mm. I love having the process and the clay is speaking to me and the glazes and the, and the firing and all that kind of stuff, but I don't have to work with anybody. Mm. And so it's like just me and my idea of what this should look like and the flow and all that's wonderful. So you want but it wasn't complex. It wanted... wasn't complex enough. Okay. And so, so you like complexity. I liked complexity. And so then I had a friend who was working at Richard Meyer's office and said, "Hey, we're hiring." So I went down there, interviewed, got an offer. They were working on some beautiful projects, and Richard mm. Meyer had always been the style, at least, it's something that when I was in school, I really admired, you know, the white New York white and the, modernism. you know, totally. <laughs> and so I started working there and left ceramics, but I learned. No, but how did you move skills, then from so uh, Meyer so and sort of this high modernism yeah. to, the, 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 to the, you know, much more multidisciplinary yeah. place you ended up? It, you know, it's such a long story, right? <laughs> okay. So, you know, all these pieces, uh, in hindsight, yeah. you can look back and say, I, I learned these things from these pieces of my life, right? right? But at the time that you're in it, yeah, it was totally done. confusing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so some of it I did because it was the sort of expected thing to do, like to sure. graduate from the GSD and go work for Pay Cub Freedom Partners was pretty normal. Lots yeah. of people did it, yeah. right? To leave for ceramics was not so normal. Right. And then, you know, the Meyer one was maybe more back to the traditional or, or the stereotype of what a GSD grad would do. Yeah. Um, we had the opportunity to start our own firm, my husband and I. Okay. And so we so took it. So he's an architect? He's an architect. Mm -hmm. He was GSD with me. Well, okay. And so you're classmates? We're classmates. Yeah. I, I, okay. I said I would never date an architect and I ended and up marrying one. But, you know, you know. <laughs> so it's easy when we travel. <laughs> we don't have to argue about going down these long pilgrimages to yeah. take one picture. <laughs> <laughs> I'm married to an architect. I don't know <laughs> oh, if it works out so easily. But anyway. Well, we did a house together. We had a practice together. Uh -huh. So uh, so we practiced for a while. And in the end, what happened is I had all these great experiences in these different firms and realized that it still wasn't satisfying something. Mm. And that I finally realized that the thing it wasn't satisfying was the teaching part. Oh, ah, okay. And so I had taught some in graduate school, mm. drawing, mm. not architecture and started um, really missing teaching and then getting more and more involved with that. And we tried to keep the practice going and it was just too hard. Mm. And then I realized that, and I'd always thought I would be teaching drawing and design. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but you know, the first person to hire me to teach at University of Michigan said, well, you've got all this great practice background. We'd really like you to teach some case studies on design and construction. Mm. And so when I started looking at the teaching materials available for design and construction, they were mostly like Ed Allen's textbooks and mm. Frank Ching's textbooks. Right, right. And they didn't have a lot of case studies. Yeah. And I had experienced through my, you know, different offices of the struggle it takes to fit a detail that's consistent with the much larger parti or overall geometry down to the level of centimeters. Right, right. And right. whether something was a gap and you know, we'd have these long debates in Richard Meyer's office about whether yeah. the grid was in the middle of the center line or shifted off, and so is it five centimeters on either side, or was that five centimeters centered and it was mm -hmm. two, two and a half on mm -hmm. either, like these long debates, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. And so I, that was what I was interested in teaching to students, okay. was in you, you know, when you get passionate about a detail related to a larger design idea, yeah. and how that's designed too, and yeah. it's not all about the big yeah, gesture. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was one of the few people teaching that tried to do case studies, and yeah. I realized that there wasn't a lot of material on it at that time. Okay. And so I started developing case studies, and then I realized that was helping me balance my love for teaching with my love for complex practice. Mm. And so my husband and I were doing, you know, a house or a little addition or right. a community center was our big one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and, but I missed like airports and like, you know, 
And you right. don't do an airport with at that time, especially yeah, without yeah. BIM and all that. Yeah, yeah. With two people, you don't do an yeah, airport, I, right? I still and don't so, think you can do that. Yeah. Right. So I was able to like call up the team that did Stansted Airport and mm. interview the people about the structural system in the bay and talk to the Arab people that did the engineering for it. And it was so fascinating. And mm. it was fascinating for students. Mm. And then you could lo loop that into design and construction. And then from there, again, I saw a gap in representation. And so what was shifting from drawing to CAD was kind of like, that's not that interesting. Right. But the shift from drawing to BIM sure. was much more interesting. And no one seemed to be really tracking it. So practice was adopting it. Mm -hmm. But in academia, a lot of people were thinking it was just another another AutoCAD. Software, yeah. And I was saying, it's a database. Mm. Think about what you can do by querying Paradigm a database. Shift, yeah. you know, And mm. it's parametric. Mm. And what does that mean for our teaching? Mm. So I actually did a, a little seminar studio using string and pins to say, OK, if you move this geometry, then you lengthen the string. And you know, so like an yeah. analog version yeah, of a kind of abstract idea of descriptive geometry mm -hmm that underlies BIM. Mm -hmm. And so testing some of that stuff out, and then that led to me saying, OK, the way people are using these BIM models is very interdisciplinary. And they actually need legal protections to use it in ways that they feel responsible and that they can share that information without feeling liable. Mm -hmm. And so <coughs> then I started tracking integrated project delivery and lean and deliver, you know, so if you look back, it so all makes sense, it's right? It's a chain link. But it's it was just all like, oh, this, other. and a lot of it was gaps, right? Yeah, like I was teaching, I wanted to, I was interested. I thought it was something our students should know as yeah. they go into future practice. There was very little textbooks or teaching material. Mm. So I had to create the teaching material, which then ended up, you know, I was interviewing some of the top people in the early BIM days, mm -hmm. some of the top people in the early IPD days, and they were like, well, you're, it's weird, you're an academic, mm -hmm. you know, and then often the only woman, often the only person of color, and yes. often the only academic. What was, yeah. And so when you ask, like, you know, yeah. tying it all back to the woman of color, yeah. is that there were so many conferences that I was at where the women's bathroom was just empty, or the only women at the conference were really? staff. Yeah. Because the early BIM days, Nobody. it was all architectural technology, software people, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the um, early days of looking at Did you feel special or so unique, or did you feel um, like, what the hell am I doing here? It's a little tiring sometimes, right? Yeah. You know, it, and it was uh, sometimes, so I would often be in architectural meetings, which shifted over the time that I was teaching to be more diverse and mm -hmm. more, a lot more women in academia, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you'd go in a faculty meeting and there'd be, you know, our, in Minnesota, it was half and half. So yeah, it was sure. like really pretty yeah. equal. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'd go to an AIA meeting. Yeah. And it'd be, you know, less diverse, but a little bit more mixed. And then I'd go to a technology and practice meeting and mm -hmm. it would be all white men. Right. And it'd be like, oh, this is what the profession looked. This is what an AIA meeting looked like 20 years ago, when I first started going to AIA meetings. Yeah. When I was the only woman and person of color, right. you would have these throwbacks, and right. so now it's slowly starting to change. But you know, it was more just. You think it's all changing? So you think it's going in the positive direction? Demographically, direct? some of the things are blending more. I think there's still major underrepresentation um, in architecture and, and across the whole building industry, but. Mm. It used to be that some of these subspecialty areas that I was in, mm. there was such a small number of people involved that it just didn't reflect the diversity even of the larger AA group. So, Do you think to a certain extent you sort of got into these subspecialities because you felt, you know, I have a right <laughs> to be there? Or is it just as you described it, you know, one thing followed the other? Uh, are know. you like militant in that way? Not no, militant, but no, 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 no. I didn't look at it and say, "Wow, they need more diversity," and they need that. That's why, for me, a lot of this came, and the whole equity, diversity, intercultural part came after many years of doing all that, adapting, and um, code switching, or whatever you want to call it, and realizing, you know, it's tiring. There are times where you feel like you have to just have a thick skin and just realize, okay, they didn't mean to offend me even though they just said something you really offensive. You think that offensive. happened a lot? You, it happens, in inadvertently, yeah. people were saying things that So, you, right, intent and outcome, right? right and right. so was never 
rarely have I experienced racism that's been intentionally hurtful or exclusionary. But often I've heard things where, pe and you know, most of the time people don't realize. Mm -hmm. Other Sometimes they do and they might apologize or something, but sometimes they don't really realize. And, right. you know, it's, um, you know, it's something that kind of, it depends on where your point of view is. And I had work to get done and I had relationships I needed to build with people. So and you, you just kind of move on. Move on. Mm. And then later, as I got more into the equity stuff, like why, why is this? So I did see change and mm -hmm. I thought, oh great, we're taken care of. I don't need to do anything, right? Yeah. It's all changing. Yeah. And then I was like, wait a minute, why is this so slow? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Maybe I, I do need to do something. Maybe this isn't just going to organically change. Right. And then I started noticing more about some of the more institutional systemic things that are keeping people out or not being people welcome or right. not getting it out to people that might do something different with it. Right. So that was kind of a later, a later but I lived it. Right. And then I mean, afterwards is, was able to make sense out of it. Now this is your big so, thing. I mean, now... It is the big thing in some ways it is certainly the piece that um edi is certainly the piece that most people are associating with my leadership in mm -hmm. in um in the six months that i've been here so sure. far right yeah um because it's quite visible we've invested in it we've got the university to invest in it right um i am passionate about it it is something that i think is really important to the success of the college success of the industry mm -hmm. um but i would say there's a lot of things that I'm equally passionate about that I think are connected. Right? Okay. Like it's just the amount of waste in the building industry and the amount of sure. waste that happens because of missed opportunities or um, buildings that cost more energy to operate than they really are um, paying back in any other way, like the lack of resiliency, the, okay. um, yes. the kind of things that happen with, uh, with disasters and just the amount of destruction that could have been anticipated and dealt with. And so you're fixing things that you should have been able to anticipate. The dis uh, disparities that are happening in communities that we should have known ahead of time, we should have found ways to ask people what they wanted and really be able to include them, those are all waste. You know, it's wasted opportunity. It's building something that doesn't match the real needs. Mm -hmm. It's losing human capital. It's wasting actual materials. It's wasting carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. So I actually, in a lot of ways, really dislike wasted effort and energy and the types of really negative impacts that can happen, all with good intentions. Right, right. right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, that impact versus intentions, and no one intends to build a building that's gonna be really wasteful. But you look at some of them and you just think, you know, if we had just made smarter decisions, more informed decisions, earlier decisions, it would have been a better building, more beautiful building, a building that uplifted people more, that lasted more, that people cared about more. So for me, that's waste. And it's all related sure. to how do you think about this, but that's probably the kind of more core than EDI or not that specific. Yeah. What happened to social housing? <laughs> <laughs> well, so now I'm doing this Nehemiah studio. I'm doing one little piece of it, the equitable practice part, mm -hmm. and it is looking at affordable housing. It's looking at faith-based community building, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's not just housing. It's the it's that those communities in the central district here in mm -hmm. Seattle are losing their culture, they're mm. losing their people, their people don't have a place that they can afford to live that is in the community that they want to live in. Mm -hmm. They're not given the choices to define the community in the ways that they feel will make sense. They often can't necessarily articulate exactly what's wrong with what's up, but you can tell that people are leaving, they're not staying. So housing is one piece of it. But, you know, I must say housing is hard and complicated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I didn't, as a student, and you know, GSD was not super well set up. Well, housing to deal has been in decline. I mean, nationally, there was a time when well, you were, couldn't call yourself an architect, architect unless without you, you knew. really did housing. But did, were we really doing housing in the era that produced Pruitt Igo and those things? Were we really working with economists, even behavioral make, economists? Even if we were making so mistakes, at least we were doing yes, housing. Yes. Well, now it seems to be we have sort well, of given it up. Yeah, although we were making pretty big mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. I mean, I think housing, I would love to see the students in the Nehemiah studio 
um, you know, we've got real estate, urban planning, architecture on the faculty side, mm. but we're also talking with people in the law school, people in the business school. Okay. Looking at, um, you know, we should also, depends on how far we get with this, but, you know, the Evans School, the social work, you know, there's a lot of ways of working. And then obviously the communities and this Nehemiah Initiative, which is a set of churches yeah. that are self-identifying and right, trying right, to figure right. this out, yeah. some developers they've been working with, you know, different groups. And so, you know, this to me is a wonderful way to look at housing from understanding all the different layers to it. It gets so complicated sometimes you get paralyzed. So how are we gonna get to a point where we know what we're proposing that makes sense? But, you know, I think we're, that's, that's where architects often in the past solved housing from a largely formal and programmatic point of view, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as opposed to really understanding the program as part of something much larger. So from a teacher and a practicing person and architect and, uh, and thinker, how did you decide to get into academic administration? That's a good question. I mean, I think, so my husband would say it's because I'm bossy. <laughs> um, I would say because I, I don't like wasted opportunity. I often see things that could be done either more efficiently or more effectively with student learning or with the way the faculty spend their time and how sequences of curricula build upon each other. And so I really enjoy in my own teaching looking at how exercises build, either not necessarily logically, linearly, that you would sometimes set up a set of expectations and then invert it with some quick exercises that just flip everything inside mm -hmm. out and then that becomes really productive, right? So the idea of kind of understanding how pedagogy builds, mm -hmm. then I started coordinating a series of classes that mm -hmm. were not all taught by me. Right. And then I started coordinating like streams in the curriculum. So mm -hmm. even as a junior faculty, mm -hmm. I was already doing curricular streams and working on, you know, foundation curriculum all the way through advanced curriculum and really enjoying all of it and seeing how it all fit together. Right. And so as I started, um, when I arrived at the University of Minnesota, they were undergoing a lot of leadership changes. There were a number of curricular things that were had been changed without um, fully thinking through all the consequences. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, this place has a lot more potential than what it's living up to. So and administration is the way to sort of a build A way that. to start to build it. And, you know, it started with directing the studio sequence. Sure. And then it was head of the School of Architecture. And then it was associate dean for research, right, partly right. because I felt like I had done so much curriculum I wanted to see on the research side. And I had done my own research, but I hadn't done the kind of range of research that all of the faculty had done in the college. Right. So that was really helpful. Mm. And then the dean position was not something I necessarily, a lot of people looked at my, cre my career. Yeah. And again, in hindsight, it always makes sense. They makes said, sense. well, the next logical step is dean. I was like, I don't know if I want to do with that. I'm mm. so far from the students. And no. you know, it doesn't, maybe it's, you know, my, my love is really curriculum. and. Um, and as a dean, you're not supposed to touch curriculum, no. and you know. So how would that work? And um, in the end, the opportunity for this college to do the things that I started at Minnesota that I felt like, you know, if I could just get a little more things aligned, a little bit more, you know. So the great thing about being in the dean role is mm -hmm. that I can put things out there, and you know, I've been talking about collaboration, interdisciplinary collaboration, for decades, right? Mm -hmm. And I write about it, I do research, I build programs around it. And everyone was kind of like, oh yeah, that's Renee's thing. Yeah, how's that going? You know, yeah, good yeah, luck, yeah, you know, yeah. check in. I come here as a dean, I say interdisciplinary collaboration is really important and there's ways to do it and we right. don't do it well enough and we can improve. And everybody's like, oh, what does that mean for the college? What might that mean for mm. my curriculum, for my research? <coughs> what kind of resources could she bring to support that? What right. do we really need to take it to the next level, right? Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden you put something out there and a whole bunch of people start thinking about ways that they could support that and mm. advance that and, and it develops into things that I, way beyond what I could think about or do on my own. Yeah, yeah. And that's by far the most exciting thing about administration is right. that you can put bigger things out there, get all these points of view on how it could move forward that often are not what you expected in good ways. Right. Well, I'm, I'm hearing a, a strong thing of, of uh, you don't like waste, you know. <laughs> you like to be frugal, you like to see efficiencies, you want to see, you know, uh, just do things better. And I could start thinking about this and say, wow, she's really an 
a mechanic. You're making me sound like a mechanic. But but no no. But where I'm going to take this? Engineer. (laughs) But where I'm going to take? I don't know. I like this, Vikram. (laughs) Okay. No, but I'm going to. Where are you going to take it? I'm going to try and take it to this ethic of frugality. Oh, like Occam's Uh, razor. uh, Yeah. I don't know what's Occam's razor, but I was going to take it to uh, it's a, it's a, see, strikes me because it's very familiar to me this way of thinking it's a kind of an immigrant ethic uh, you mm. know like turn yeah. you know can't always do, use what you make do really yeah. really yeah. put everything to maximal yeah. use yeah. Uh, is an I think an immigrant sensibility but could also yeah. be I mean, gross generalizations here, sorry, but, uh, you know, it's a sort of an Asian sensibility, too. Well, so my parents were born in China, Mm -hmm. and they both lived through the Japanese invasion and lost a lot and gave up a lot to come to America. Right. Um, I had a childhood where, you know, pretty much, you know, always, we always had enough food to eat, and but my parents did not always have enough food to eat. Right. You know, and they were... But you had enough food to eat, not because you had a lot, it's because things were... Carefully chosen. Done in a frugal way. Right. In yeah. a, there right. was no wastage, right. I would imagine. Right. Is that yeah. true? Yeah. Throwaway so, like, culture. Yeah, no, no throwaway good. culture. It was never anything like that. And that is not necessarily Asian as much as older cultures, I think, mm. that have yeah, the objects suppose, yeah, that yeah, have yeah. lasted for generations. And right. just know the, more about that appreciation of, you know, investing and the kind of energy that builds over time that right. can't be just replaced by what you might need at the moment. Right. You know, so... Um, you yeah. think that, so that th- so there is some of that, isn't there? I there would definitely say that the... I, and, you know, maybe the way I've raised my kids as well is that, um, you know, the idea of the convenience is... Um, I always have resisted things that seem convenient Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I've actually had a number of coaches say, you know, it's okay sometimes to do the easier thing. <laughs> you don't have to make it extra hard, or the hard thing is not necessarily the better thing, right? Right, 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 um, right. But right. The, if you do something for convenience, um, it's often something that maybe because you haven't thought about it enough or you haven't appreciated mm. what it is. So more that intentionality mm. part of things. But but you your mother is so. an artist. Yeah, was an artist. Is yeah. An artist? yeah, was. She passed. Was an yeah. Artist. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how did that uh, play into your life? Well, so mom always told stories, and she probably had a harder time as a child than my dad because they were both in China during the Japanese invasion, but my dad's family stayed put. They, they moved north, and they were able to mostly stay put, whereas my mom's family tried to escape and they ended up moving a lot and she often didn't have paper you know mm. and so she drew from a very very young age and had very spotty formal education and so her dad who was you know an MIT mathematician wow. who had gone back to China to teach mm-hmm. um, would take them to graveyards to draw to take her to a graveyard to draw the um, headstones because you know Graveyard? it was because there were sculptures, right? There was like oh, carvings, and there so, you know okay, so yeah. three dimensional type oh, yeah. stuff, and mm. um, so she was always you know like I remember as a really young child where she got um, so her splurges were all oil paints and nice papers, mm. and so there would be one time she was in England shopping for this watercolor paper. And it was really thick, heavy, yeah, you know, yeah, nice. hot press and cold press, and yeah. like learning the difference between them. And she was like, ah, oh. she wouldn't. She would get so excited. She's like, look at this paper, yeah. you know. And I was a little kid, and I was just like, well, it's paper. And yeah. she would explain like how it was made and like different yeah. ways it would take the ink or the washes, and you know. And so she just had this really deep joy and appreciation mm. in material. The her for her materials were related to ways that she would then be able to produce produce artwork. So yeah, a lot of things about my mom's, her own background, even though I didn't experience it in the same way, she passed those experiences and those principles. But what about her uh, sort of sense of being as an artist? Did that affect you? Yeah, oh totally. Uh, You you, you think of yourself as an artist, as a ceramic ceramicist and still as an artist in some ways? Yeah, Yeah. and um, you know, my mom was the type of artist that she loved color so much and she saw it everywhere and so there would be times where I'd be upstairs doing my homework and I'd hear her saying, ah, yeah, yeah, look at this. And I'd come running downstairs thinking something was wrong. And she would be cooking and there would be 
some combination of colors and in the ingredients in and the like peppers in the, in, the, in the in the walk wow. you know Food she's like look at that <laughs> <laughs> and so she would get, or like we'd be walking down the street and yeah. um, she would just like stop and say, look at that. And it would be some little vignette right. of color. Right. And so that idea of like that intentionality, that looking, the serendipity of finding things and like, you know, the, and a lot of that also, if you want to tie to some other influences is when I was teaching in graduate school, I taught a drawing class that was taught by a guy named William Ryman, who mm. I'm still in touch with. Mm. He was a student of Joseph Albers. Ah, I see. And when Albers was at Yale. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot around how, and so I was, that was my first formal drawing class. Like I had drawn for a long time. My mom kind of taught me different things. But the first formal drawing class I had for credit, let's mm. say, mm. as an undergrad at Harvard, was this class, which is very close to Albers. Right. Exercises I see. around like folded paper corners, tabletops, right. Right. you know, ellipses, bagels, uh -huh. toruses. I see. And the observation of like really looking at the shape and not having your preconceived idea of what this looks like. Yeah. That you're not drawing from your idea, but you're drawing from your eyes and your hand. Mm. And that connection of like forgetting forgetting your preconceived ideas I know. and entering mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. that kind of flow state. Yeah. I love that. You know, so whether it's whether it's ceramics or drawing or cooking, you know, it's when you're making stuff and you're able to like lose your preconceived ideas and just go with what it's telling you. That's so great. It doesn't that happen enough. And it occasionally will happen with curriculum. Well if we have or to try with that in curriculum. Groups Why of don't faculty, right? Where mm -hmm. like something just comes together and it's Amazing. Well, it's a very so, high modernist so. sensibility that you just described. I mean, with Joseph Albers anyway. I mean, this is a very high modernist way of looking at things. Questioning, forgetting. For, forgetting everything, yeah. being very Starting innocent yeah. to, to yeah. your perception, yeah. and then looking at things anew. Uh, and, and, and certainly one of the high modernist curriculums is the Bauhaus mm -hmm. curriculum, which still hangs around as a ghost in all schools of but there are, there are exercises that Bauhaus did that you really can't improve that much on, and so you can like swap some modern pieces in there, but some of the basic formal exercises, if you're trying to teach formal composition, mm. you can do that pretty effectively, <laughs> <laughs> and you don't always need to reinvent. So, so you, know, you, you still swear by Bauhaus somewhat. That's amazing. I think the nine square, there's a lot of things that, you know, and it's maybe some students are beyond that now, but... I think that you know, for if you're if you only have, you know, and, and nowadays because I'm not teaching that much, I often will only get invited in for like one thing, mm. right? So if I only get one thing, um, I may teach them something as basic as drawing a folded piece of paper, mm. you know, and because it, it brings up so many things around proportion, around observation, around geometry and projection. Right. So you can use those, and so sometimes like doing a super elaborate exercise. Right is not always the best way to go. Mm. So let's turn to Seattle now and just our university and thinking a little bit about the future here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've talked about some of the things that you're talking about here in the college, but uh, w what has surprised you uh, after coming to Seattle and joining yeah. the university? Yeah. Uh, uh, has anything sort of jumped out For at you? For sure, yeah. I mean, I think you... Um, you always can get clues of things that then later, even a little bit later, they make more sense to you. And so, um, you know, a, a big part of what was really attractive to me about UW was Anamari. Mm -hmm. And I had been following her in the Chronicle of Higher Ed and the way that she talked about race and justice and yeah. higher ed. And that was super inspiring. And if you look at the board of deans and mm -hmm. how many new deans there are, Many of the new deans were not deans before, mm. and so they're coming in their first deanship, right? And we're kind of learning together and asking similar questions. I see. And she's brought a group that all have their own take on community engagement and diversity, equity, and access, and social justice issues, and the role of the university in society yeah. in their own unique ways. But they're um, so the discussions that have been happening at the board of deans have been really amazing and mm. much more energizing and far-reaching than I was expecting. Because I guess I didn't really know, because I've been, you know, administrative before, and most meetings of administrators, there's 
90% business and a little bit of the kind of bigger mm -hmm. touching base on the vision and moving forward. The Board of Deans meetings is it's at least 50-50. I mean, we do talk about you know how it gets down to action, but it always goes back up to kind of the bigger picture. And so if we look at the values that we want to embody mm -hmm. and being able to have you know, high quality of life for our faculty and our staff, right. ability for our students to feel welcome and have access. Mm -hmm. How does that play out in our spaces? Like what do our spaces say about power, about who's getting access or larger spaces? Or how can we look at instrumentalizing some of our buildings to say, can we look at productivity and size of windows or, you know, the distance that someone walks? and use our university community mm. as a, a way to say we would like to improve the quality of life for the people that are part of our university community. And, and, you, and you think the board of, you know, I've often heard of the board of deans as a sort of a strong power situation with some really big heavy deans. That but you think there's a, the culture has changed and, you know, we, we could be, because we are a small unit on campus. We are a small unit. We are not the smallest, but we are a small unit. Um, yeah. So yes, there are definitely times where our small size has been means that you know certain policies or programs are set up for much larger units. But um, generally speaking, in academia, mm -hmm. the large units are academic health, business, law, yeah, engineering. Yeah, sure. Right here, law school, brand new dean, mm -hmm. business school, brand new dean as of the summer, mm -hmm. and engineering, brand new dean who hasn't even arrived yet. She's coming in November. Right. 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 And medical school person has been here for a really long time, but he's actually super interested in Lean and BIM and mm. has already talked to me about trying oh, to get really? involved with some of their new projects. That's great. And so also a new facilities person mm -hmm. who is really looking to see where can the university invest more in its own maintenance mm. and kind of creating a long-term plan for the spaces. And so there's a lot of openness. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, there's probably I, I always heard also that Board of Deans was kind of, there was a sort of pecking order based on like yeah. how large your research budget is yeah, and things yeah. like that. And I haven't seen it here. Oh, Maybe right. it's coming, but okay. I haven't seen it here. Well, that's good. <laughs> it's been super exciting yeah. and very um, affirming and also eye-opening in ways that are really, really great. So I think that part's been... Surprising, because I also did think, okay, we're a tiny college. I'm just going to go and try to take notes and do my best to fight for our college. Right, right. right. It's not been like that. It's oh, been much good. more kind of like, okay, what are the what's out there? And because facilities and capital planning yeah. is coming, it's one of three initiatives that mm. the provost is setting forward with the, for this next year. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm right in that group of right. of that task force looking at that, mm. and it's on everyone's top of mind of saying we can't be careless about what we're doing with our spaces and our future spaces and you know what can we do and so I'm the voice in there saying let's aim high let's right. not just try to be you know kind of not running into debt or not having problems fixing our windows or our elevators right. let's talk about you know where what does the future workplace look like what right. does it mean to mm. have a um, we know the physical environment has such an impact on health but we don't know more enough about specifics and how we can influence that positively you know so we need we could do that that's with great our campus that's so, great it's good yeah. if we are if we are heard uh, so in conclusion have we found any good places to eat in Seattle oh, <laughs> let's see I was just thinking I need to find more I was, I, you know you and I trade trade little tips every once in a while um, I was at Le Pichet last night. Oh, I took one great. of our guests yeah, there. Yeah. It's right around the corner from where I'm living right now. This great furnished rental right by the market. Yeah. And I actually cook a lot because I live right down by the market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but Le Pichet was so French. <laughs> 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 and it was very nice. Like, I don't know what the, it must be the butter or something. I don't know, you know. But it definitely, like, I took a bite and I was like, I, this is, I, this is better than what I could make at home on French. So I'm picky because I cook a lot. And so I, when I go out, I yeah. want it to be something better than what I would make at home. Right, right. So like the dumplings are great because I, you know, I, I can do those, but yeah, yeah, they yeah. take a long time. Yeah. And then my teenagers just inhale them, and like right. that's like all those hours of work. It's like gone, gone in fifteen minutes. <laughs> right, you know? right, 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 right. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm glad we were able to give you a taste of France in Seattle. <laughs> Thank you for being an architecture talk, Renee. Thank you.
Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is Vikram Prakash, your host, and our producer is the one and only Sammy Prouty, a graduate student of architecture here at the University of Washington in Seattle. I hope you all enjoyed our conversation, and if you did, please do take a moment to subscribe and to rate us on iTunes. See you next time. Take care. Goodbye.